Hi, and welcome back once again to Unstoppable Mindset. Glad to have you with us wherever you may be and however you're listening to us. Brittany Grubbs Hodges is our guest this week. We have lots of fun things to talk about. We've been spending the last few minutes kind of reacquainting ourselves after chatting and also talking about all the things we could talk about. She is getting a PhD in higher education. She has a master's degree in journalism, but she wouldn't even let me talk about fake news. I don't know what's all that about, but anyway, um, but we, we can talk about everything. And as people on this podcast know, I'm an equal opportunity political abuser, so it doesn't matter. And um, so there's real news too. I haven't seen much of that lately because it's all fake news as everybody tells us, right? <laughs> but anyway, Brittany, welcome to Unstoppable Mindset. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you for having me today. And now that we've picked on fake news, we can get to more real stuff. So you just got back, you said, from D.C. How was it up there? It was great. Yeah, I just got back. I took about 20 students. Uh, I'm a professor at UF, and I took about 20 undergraduate students to D.C., um, mainly to just expose them to the world of work. Um, you know, they like to say the real world, but the students are in the world or, but I just want them to get an idea of the world of work specifically. Uh, I work for a department, it's called Beyond 120 at the University of Florida. It's our experiential learning program. Uh, so we encourage them to get outside of the classroom through things like internships, through mentorship, through excursions or study abroad. So this was one of our career excursions. We took them to various places around DC, uh, USA Today, um, the Capitol building, all kinds of places. And hopefully, you know, some of those opportunities will really come to fruition. I know a couple of my students have interviews already, so I'm excited to see what comes from that. How did uh, they come up with the name Beyond 120? So that's a great question. Uh, so 120 is the number of academic credits needed to graduate with a baccalaureate ah. degree. So it's kind of a metaphorical in that we're not asking you to take more credits. Uh, we're just asking you to go beyond what's required by really exploring outside of the classroom. Yeah, that is so much fun and, and important. I remember being in college years ago, uh, getting a master's degree in physics, and there was no real discussion of either extracurricular activities, although there were a number of things available and so on, but there were programs like a beyond 120. Um, I did end up getting very involved on campus at the campus radio station. And I got involved in being in consumer group of blind people, the National Federation of the Blind in my senior year, and then continued with it ever since. But it, it makes a lot of sense to get people to really explore additional sorts of things. And if you will, as you said, look at a little bit of the real world, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And especially in the world of COVID, everything has really changed. Um, you know, you have hybrid workforce, you know, offices now and that people only come in on Tuesdays or, you know, every other day. Some some folks we were working with, uh, they have teams. So team A will come in one day and then team B will come in the next day. So it's really certainly changed since we last took our excursion. So we've, we've taken four excursions this semester, but prior to that, uh, we our last excursion was February of 2020. So it's been a full mm -hmm. two years and a lot of students have had their experiences canceled. A lot of their internships went virtual, a lot of study abroad experiences were canceled. So we're really trying to kind of make up for that uh, and try and get some students access and exposure to, to some of the jobs and some of the, just the industries out there. Not trying to be political or anything, but what was it like COVID wise up in, in DC? Was masking encouraged or, you know, what other kinds of things did you see? Yeah, so it really depended on the individual place. So we went to Georgetown uh, University to get our students who were interested in graduate school, we wanted to get them some exposure to what law school was like in graduate school. And um, they have a mandate not only for the vaccine, but also for the booster um, and of course masks as well. And then some folks, um, which of course private companies, it's up to them, it's at their discretion. Uh, but I did have to have the students uh, bring their COVID cards because for some of the entities they were not allowed in without it so yeah. it certainly was not a university of florida regulation but it was up to the individual entity that was hosting us and they all had very different um regulations depending on you know how many people were visiting with social distancing versus masking versus vaccinations all that fun stuff 
Did you go to Congress or the White House or any of those at all? So we went to the Capitol building, which was a blast. Uh, we went yeah. with our, our local um, congresswoman and she took us around. I believe we were with her for about two hours. Uh, mm -hmm. She took us around and showed us a few of the different offices and different areas of, of the Capitol building. We weren't able to go in because Congress was in session. Yeah. Uh, so we weren't able to go in and actually see in the main room there, but we did see some of the areas on the outskirts um, of those rooms. Who, who was your congressperson? Uh, Kat Kamek. Haven't met her. I've spent a fair amount of time in D.C. over the years dealing with Congress. Uh, I went with the National Federation of Blind a number of times mm -hmm. to invade Congress and talk all about the issues regarding blind people and so on. And I've been there some other times as well. So I've met a number of people. I don't think I've met her. So she is our local representative, uh, but we also met with Congressman, Congresswoman uh, Washerman Schultz. She's also a UF alumni. Um, so we yes. made sure to meet with uh, a variety of folks throughout the trip on, on both sides of the aisle. And, I've, and I have met her and she has sponsored legislation. So she's a, a cool lady as well. Yes, it's always great to meet UF alums that can share their stories with students and really uh, mentor some of the students. Makes perfect sense. Um, and going to Washington is, is an experience that I would encourage anyone to do. But of course, there's so much history there, it makes perfect sense to do. Yes, absolutely. And I wanted the students to get some history as well. So we gave them some free time, one of the days to go and explore uh, all the museums nearby, some of the Smithsonian's that are now open. So they were able to see uh, most of those um, and, and really get some time exploring to, to see their history. Have you been there before? I have. We did a uh, excursion uh, there in 2019. Um, that was actually our pilot excursion. So Beyond 120 was not created until 2018. So uh, myself and one of my coworkers were one of the first uh, hired in, in the department. And we kind of met and said, okay, what, what is it that we want to do? What's going to help students out? And so we did an excursion to DC with eight students in 2019, just to see if this would work, if it's a good concept at all. And, and it did, it worked well. So um, we were able to go to DC in 2019. And then in London in February of 2020, and funny story there, we were at The Economist um, the Thursday before uh, the place shut down. They shut down on a Friday. So we, we were there the day before they shut down. So we just barely uh, got out of the UK. And thankfully, no one tested positive. It was, we, we just made it by the skin of our teeth. <laughs> I escaped from New York in March of 2020 on the day they wow. shut down the wow. city. I knew that it was coming because they were talking about it. And I had had a flight later in the day, I decided I better get out of here. And so I was able to and I put it that way escape before it was all shut down. And I understand why and it made perfect sense to do but it's just so unfortunate that all this is going on. And you know, we, we got to deal with it, though, it is part of life now. Absolutely. Well, tell me a little bit about you where you you came from and how you got into the University of Florida and, and ended up in the programs that you did. Yeah, absolutely. So when it comes to my story, I had a very non-traditional journey. Um, and so I'd love to go over with you later on in this podcast, some of the folks that really influenced me. Um, but I had a non-traditional journey. I actually had an immune deficiency um, whenever I you know, well, it is a genetic thing, but I'll say it really made a, a huge impact on my uh, career and my college trajectory because I eventually going into adulthood, I had to have plasma infusions twice a week. So I spent my first two years local uh, and my second two years, about two hours away at the University of Central Florida. Um, but every weekend I had to come back and get a plasma infusion twice a week. And um, it definitely... Uh, altered my my career trajectory and it and it altered the opportunities that were available. But I will say, uh, while I was there, uh, my first semester at, at UCF, which was the first semester of my junior year, I said, you know, I've, I've kind of missed out on the first two years, but I need to make up for that. How can I do that? 
that. And there was an office of experiential learning at UCF and I was able to find an internship, um, really saw the power of internships. I ended up working, it was at a hospital system called Orlando Health and worked there for about two and a half years um, before switching over to the education side. Uh, and I, I initially switched to a K through 12. So I, I taught um, grades six through 12 at a private school but found that, that that wasn't really my my niche. I love teaching, but that particular age group wasn't really my niche. So I switched to higher education, uh, worked in admissions for about five years, uh, working with students in that college transition. But then when the opportunity came to join Beyond 120, I remembered my days as an intern and thought this is going to be perfect for me. I'm so excited to be able to kind of pay it forward to have uh, future students connected with internships and job opportunities because my internship was so influential for me. So that's kind of how I got into higher education. How was teaching lower grades different or how did you find them different than teaching upper grades and getting into <laughs> juniors and seniors in high school? And I asked that in part because my wife was a teacher for many years and loved teaching younger grades more than older grades because she felt she had a little bit more of an opportunity to help shape the way be they behave later, because by the time they were in high school, they were a lot more fixed and less interested in, in exploring a lot of things that maybe they should have. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess for me, I mean, I was raised on a, on a ranch and I had a very strict upbringing. And so whenever I went to, to teach, a lot of my students did not have that strict upbringing. And I would hear them think, say things like, he's touching me, he's looking at me weird, he's breathing on me, he's, and it was just, it drove me absolutely crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so that yeah. sounds terrible. But, um, but no, I just, I was definitely wanting to be able to see, I'm not even quite sure the best way to say it, but be able to see the difference that I was making and that, you know, with a student that I was able to admit, at least with admissions, with a student I was able to admit into college, I could see that transition. And a lot of times those students would come back to me and say, hey, this is what I've done while I'm here. And moving towards beyond 120, I could see, for example, one of the students that I've been working with for several semesters, we were able to get her an interview at NASA last week. And she said, oh my gosh, all of my efforts that I've done have paid off. She's taken my classes. She did the excursion. She's doing the internship and now the full-time job. And so to, to know that I've had a part in that is incredibly rewarding. And I'm just humbled and honored by the fact that I can be a part of students' journeys and really truly have an impact in where they go in life. And, and I'm, I'm so thankful and grateful for that. So it sounds like what I'm hearing you say is that you're helping to to teach people that and students that life is an adventure, which is something that conceptually is probably a little bit easier for them to think about and assimilate in later grades, because how do you tell a kindergartner that life's an adventure? <laughs> Well, and, and even sometimes students who, let's just say a student has a degree in philosophy, the student will come to me and say, what do I, what, what can I do with a degree in philosophy? And my answer is anything you want to do with a degree in philosophy. Let's see, what do you love doing? What are you passionate about? What do you enjoy? Um, you know, and just trying to figure out and really dig deeper into what that student may or may not realize they even want to do and, and kind of expose them to all these different opportunities out there to see what resonates. So yeah, I love saying life is an adventure. Let's explore that together and see, you know, what's going to be the best fit for you. And even if they start on a career or they decide to go down one road, you never know when you might have to change and being flexible, yeah. being a little bit more broader and thinking really can help people deal with things that come along and may change their pathways over time. Absolutely. And that's one of the biggest lessons that we teach students is that career paths are not linear. You know, they might be for some students who, you know, have a degree in, a, in accounting, they might want to be an accountant. And, you know, that's, that's a linear thing. But for a lot of our students, their journeys aren't linear. And I know my journey in particular was not linear. Um, but, but yeah, we're super excited to be able to, to impact those students. And, you know, even my non-traditional students love that, love that, love that. We have a program called the University of Florida Online Program, which is 
fully 100% online degrees and a lot of my non-traditional students are still enrolled in my classes and take the excursions and do the internships. So, um, you know, that's oftentimes even more rewarding. Um, I know I had a student about a year ago who had an immune deficiency, just like I did. And she, um, because of her, her condition, uh, she was homebound and she could not leave to participate in some of our activities. And so I said, you know what, let's, let's see what you can participate in. And we were able to organize a few virtual internships for her. So it's certainly very rewarding and love seeing the impact on students. So in your case, what happened um, in terms of the immune situation? You were taking transfusions. I gather that has been able to be stopped. Yes. Oh, we're so thankful. So thankful. Um, I took plasma infusions for about five years. Um, and thankfully, my body reacted to the infusions and was able to um, develop immunity on its own. Um, so very thankful to my immunologist um, for all of his hard work. And it, it certainly took a while uh, for us to figure out, you know, the dosage and whatnot. There were times that I had six needles in me at one time trying to infuse all of this plasma um, because it was done subcutaneously instead of intravenously. So mm. there was there were several obstacles and I certainly got discouraged at some points. And, and that's why I wanna help to make those impacts on students because I see them often getting discouraged, not necessarily because of a physical condition like mine, um, but because you know they, they might have financial obstacles. They might have had students who because of COVID became homeless. You know, So trying to say, okay, what can we do to make your situation better? So in your case, though, as you as you pointed out, you got discouraged and so on. How did you move past that? How did you pump yourself up, if you will, to, to keep going? Well, I think my family had a big part in that. Uh, my mother, she was with me um, through every single infusion. And, um, I think she could see how challenging it was at 20 years old to have to come home every single weekend for two years straight to have to do infusions. And so she truly encouraged me, but also the, the power of prayer. I mean, personally, um, I, I'm a very strong believer in Christ. And that was, that was my thing. And I know not everyone, um, has a particular faith or a person to, to lean on, but for me, that was instrumental in my journey. But there is merit to leaning on something, whoever you are, uh, as, as long as it's a, a positive thing and you can use it to help yourself move forward. Right. And I want to be that, that person that helps motivate my students in whatever capacity. I want to be that, that person that is their biggest cheerleader you know, to try and get students wherever it is that they're looking to go. So you were able to get beyond that. Do you need to do anything still to kind of monitor your immune system to make sure it doesn't repeat or are we beyond that now? Well, I actually had an appointment with my immunologist a couple of weeks ago. My, my husband and I are hoping to start a family soon. And I said, well, will this impact my child? And um, my immunologist said, probably not, but you know what, let's just monitor it. We'll take it day by day um, and, and kind of go from there. So as of now, I'm doing good, very thankful, um, but yeah, doing, doing okay so far. <laughs> well, jumping forward a little bit. Um, also, I understand that you're about to get a new addition. You're adopting a puppy. I am. I'm very excited. Well, about tell that. us about the puppy. <laughs> so, so this is a mix between a Rhodesian Ridgeback and a, a lab. Um, we, we basically got this dog from our, my parents, uh, groomers. And so we're, we're excited about getting this dog, but I mentioned that I grew up on a, on a ranch and we had cows and horses and turkeys and, you know, all of the, the animals. And so this will be my first time since, uh, my parents sold our farm uh, about seven years ago. This will be my first time getting a, a dog, another dog. So I'm very excited about it. <laughs> wow. Rhodesian Ridgeback and Lab. So yeah. it will probably be a fairly good sized puppy dog by the oh, yes. time it's full grown. Oh, yes, absolutely. But if you can take care of a horse, you can take care of anything. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, I wasn't so concerned about that. It'll be a big dog. And yeah. are we going to allow it on the bed? Um. Probably not. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> uh, probably not. It, but we'll see. We'll we'll cross that bridge, and when we come to it, it'll probably be another four to six weeks before the puppy's weaned. But but yeah, we'll, we'll have to have that discussion, my husband and I. <laughs> my wife always wants to 
let our dogs on the bed. Um, right now, the only dog we have is Alamo, who is my guide dog, a black lab. And I will not let him get on the bed because I know if that happens once, it's all over. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> once it happens one time, he's going to stay on the bed. And it's kind of one of those things that you you do have to to monitor. On the other hand, she had a dog. It was a breeder for guide dogs for the blind that became her service dog. She's in a wheelchair. She's used a chair her whole life. Mm -hmm. And this dog, who was very intelligent, picked up providing services for her, like fetching things, which she had originally not been trained to do. But Karen always would encourage her to be on the bed. And as I love to tell people, Fantasia always took her half out of the middle of the bed. Oh, my God. So I can think that it would be tough with a dog that will most likely be even larger than a lab. Yes, yes. But well, fingers crossed, she'll have a good personality. And we're excited. <laughs> Yeah, that's the thing. Well, you'll have some control over that, uh, unless it's just a very strange dog. Uh, <laughs> dogs oftentimes do take on some of the personality of, of their people, as long as the people are working really hard to make the home a good one and establish a good relationship. So my money's on you to be able to deal with that. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to try my hardest. <laughs> you'll have to keep us posted. We'll do. We'll do. So you, you were able to deal with the immune deficiency and you were able to then graduate. So did you go to UCF for, for the rest of your undergraduate career or what? Yeah, so I went to um, a community college called FSDJ uh, in Jacksonville, Florida for my first two years. I uh, went to um, UCF for my uh, last two years and I continued on doing um, plasma infusions until a I was probably about a year post-graduation um, mm. and I had them, I mean, because they, they have to be refrigerated. Most plasmas have to be refrigerated. Right. So they, they delivered it to my work. I had a refrigerator there and um, they just kind of made some accommodations for me. Um, but yeah, I, I went all the way through graduation uh, with those plasma infusions and um, continued on into the workforce. And ironically enough, I worked at a hospital. <laughs> <laughs> for my internship and part of my first job. So um, it didn't weird anyone out whenever I was getting plasma <laughs> delivered to me. Um, well, how did that work when you were getting um, infusions at work and so on? Did, did someone actually do the infusions or was it something you could do? Yeah, actually, every single infusion that I ever had past the first three weeks were, were all me. And um, it, because it's done subcutaneously, you end up getting... I don't know the best way to say it, I guess it's like little fat pockets, um, yeah. where, where your stomach is or your legs are wherever it is that you're getting your infusions because you're putting essentially liquid right underneath the skin. And so it would kind of be, um, bloated, I guess, wherever that yeah. area is. And so, um, I would just have to wear loose fitting clothing and I had, uh, because the infusions took anywhere from one to two hours to do. And so whenever I, I graduated, um, and there were times when I had to have an extra infusion. So I do that at work and I would just kind of take my little carrying case with me and people would see tubes kind of going inside my clothes. And I, I would just say, oh, I'm having a plasma infusion. No one really felt comfortable asking like more details. Uh, I did have a friend of mine who I worked with who, who knew what was going on. And so if there was any emergency, um, she was able to, to call someone, but Thankfully that never happened. Um, everything was okay. And, you know, I was, I was comfortable eventually just kind of living a couple hours away from home and not going back on weekends uh, after I graduated from college and just kind of doing them myself. But um, I do have a funny story. Um, we, we kind of got tired of having the infusions done in the stomach. It began to hurt really, really bad once you do it over and over. And so one of the sites that you can do a plasma infusion is in the back of your arm in like the fatty part of your arm. Mm. And so, okay. um, uh, my dad had to do those cause I couldn't reach. You couldn't right? reach. Yeah. You, you couldn't reach correctly. So, so my dad had to do those. And I mentioned, I grew up on a, on a ranch and my dad is used to giving our cows, like, you know, the, um, 
uh, vaccinations, right? So, or their annual shots or whatever it is. And of course the cowhide is extremely thick. And so he would jam that needle into the cows. And so then it, when it came time for me, he pretty much did the same motion. And I remember <laughs> screaming so hard, ah, you don't need to do it that hard. Cause he would jam that thing in into oh, the cowhide. I was like, dad, no. And so I, I never let him do that again. <laughs> I learned my lesson. <laughs> My fourth guide dog, Linny, was a yellow lab and contracted glomerular nephritis, which is a kidney disease. It actually was a morphing of Lyme's disease. But what happened is that the kidney would let out the good stuff in addition to the waste. So it, it wasn't really doing the filter that it was supposed to do. But one of the things that we needed to do with her was to give her subcutaneous fluids every other day and uh, had to put a, a liter of lactate of ringers saline solution in her just to, to really keep her very hydrated. So very familiar with the process. And we did that usually on um, her back right up near her shoulders. So there was always this big bump. Mm -hmm. She didn't mind. Um, mostly for her, it was at least she got attention. And yeah. um, so it worked out really well. Well, I'm glad that it helped at least for a little while. Yeah, it did for a while. Um, and eventually she, well, she lived three more years after the diagnosis. She guided for three years and then lived for three more years with us. So uh, we, we had her company for quite a while, which was really good. Yeah. So you went off and you graduated and then you started doing the things that you're doing now. So what exactly do you do, you do now and how are your studies going and all that? Well, I... I've been told that you are not supposed to do your PhD topic on your work, but I completely disregarded that rule. So I am doing my uh, dissertation on uh, what I'm doing at work uh, because it is a little challenging to kind of juggle everything. So um, just kind of had to pray that it all worked out and thankfully it has. But um, what I'm doing now, I created a a course, it's called Industry Insights, and this is a variable one to three credit class. And I basically connect with various UF alumni in different industries, and we co-teach a class together. And at the end of that class, the students, well, some of the students, those that want a, an internship or a full-time position, um, they will let our, our alumni co-instructor know and potentially interview for a full-time position or internship. Um, as of, I believe, spring, 21, spring 2021, which is when we piloted the class, uh, there was a student who got a full-time position in Dubai. Um, and let's see, fall of 2021, there were two uh, different students uh, who received positions. Spring of 2022, there were three students. Uh, so, so far it's been pretty consistent, say the top um, two to four students each semester getting internships or, or jobs, but, um, Honestly, in some cases, this has done the opposite and that students think, oh, I want to work in marketing or I want to go to law school or whatever the case may be. And after they take this class, they say, oh my goodness, I don't want anything to do with law school or I don't want anything <laughs> to do with this, um, which in my case, it, I think it's just as valuable for people to kind of cross things off the list as sure. it is for them to, to, to say, this is what I want to do because um, I, I can say um, in my own experience, my internship helped me solidify what I wanted to do, but I also had a second internship uh, and I won't say where because it was not a great experience, but I, I had a second internship that was very closely related to my major. I thought I wanted to work in news broadcasting. And so I did a, an internship at a, at a station and it was the worst experience. It was absolutely terrible. And it helped me solidify that this is not what I want to do. And so I tell students, you know, you don't want to get to law school spend 200 grand getting into debt and getting your law degree to just to find out you really don't want to be a lawyer or, or practice any type of law. So in, in my experience, I think it's just as valuable for students to just be exposed to the industry um, and be able to cross something off the list as to be exposed to it and realize that this is what they want to do. So, so whether it's yes or no, I think it's pretty valuable. <laughs> this, the station you worked at, was that TV or radio? Uh, it was television. Television. So, yeah, I'll bet it was awfully political, and there are a lot of challenges in, in doing that. 
Well, hey, this is, it wasn't something that I was willing to do at the time, yeah. but there's there, you have to work your way up in, in news and in broadcasting, you start off, you know, as an editor, reporter, whatnot, and you have the graveyard shift and there's just other politics that kind of go into it. And it was just some things that I just wasn't willing to do. And I think, yeah. you know, I really love the corporate side of it, being able to market our hospital services at the, at the place that I was working at. And I was like, this is really it. This is what I want to do. And to be honest, I would have been there for, oh my goodness, I don't even know how many years if it weren't for the fact that Medicaid reimbursement hit and my entire department was eliminated. And so it kind of forced me into education, but I found out that I really love teaching and it ended up being just as great of a fit. I was just about to ask what got you from all of that into education. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, your marketing background certainly would have a positive effect on you in education and teaching and so on, because you learned how to communicate with people. I did. I did. And I'll say when you're initially growing a department, it's crucial to have some of those marketing materials, things like your flyers, your um, website that, and, and I've had some web design skills. So I was able to design our website. So there were a lot of those skills that I learned, um, throughout my time in communications that really helped me build, uh, beyond 120 along with my other coworkers. So in dealing originally in marketing and then going on into education and even some dealing in news and so on off the, off the wall sub uh, question, did anything ever come up in terms of making sure that the information that you produced or the things that you were doing are now, even with 120 or classes at University of Florida, anything ever come up with making sure that that sort of stuff is accessible for people with disabilities? So, yeah, yes and no. So yeah. I was at least for my first five years, I worked in the office of admissions, like I mentioned, undergraduate admissions. So I was actually the disability coordinator for the office of admissions. And I had anywhere between probably three to 500 students every year who would apply for disability consideration. And so I worked really closely uh, with the um, disability resource center at UF. I worked really closely with them to make sure that our students um, received the disability accommodation that they requested. And um, so that, I mean, you know, of course we talked about my own disability. And so that really, it gave me a sense of empathy and it, I wanted to make sure that the students were getting what they needed. Um, so, so then moving into beyond 120, that was already at, at the forethought of, forethought of what I was doing and saying, I want to make this accessible for everyone. So COVID kind of in, in a way forced us to, to be accessible. However, we already kind of were accessible in some senses. So it really, if anything, it just made us be even more conscious about that. Um, and so, for example, we have a class, I teach a class called strategic self-marketing. I developed the class myself based on um, some of my own experiences and some of the things that, that students are um, facing right now, things like, you know, the, um, the great recession and Generation Z needs and, and just some of the things that students are facing. And so I said, how are we going to make this accessible to everyone? Because like I mentioned, I had a student who, you know, had an immune deficiency, could not leave. And, you know, there are students who are non-traditional. Perhaps they're a single parent trying to take classes. Perhaps they're they're working a full-time job trying to take care of of their own parents, right? So how do we make this accessible? So we had what's called hybrid classes. So students had the option of either coming in person to learn, because I know students <clears throat> tend to, who, who have like ADHD have a tendency to do better based on research in in-person classes. Um, so we had in-person section and at the same time we would live stream the class. Um, so for those who were at home and, and couldn't leave or, you know, were, were experiencing some type of hardship in whatever case that might be, um, both sections at the same time could learn and we could all interact with one another and learn from one another. So we didn't necessarily have um, hybrid classes before Zoom. We had asynchronous online classes for our UF online folks. And then we had traditional sections for our residential folks. 
but through COVID, it kind of gave us the technology needed to have these hybrid classes. And that's something that I still continue to this day. And I have plans to continue until I leave the University of Florida. So, so yes and no, we, we did meet with some students who needed accommodations, um, any specific accommodations. And so we met with them individually and said, what are some things that we can do to make this more accessible for you? So as a department, we, we kind of worked with all populations, myself uh, as the internship coordinator, I worked with all populations. And, you know, so, so it's, it's been um, an interesting journey uh, trying to create a, a more accessible option um, is there more that we could do? Absolutely. And my goal is to eventually have someone that we could hire to work with more non-traditional populations. And that's kind of been in the works, but, um, but yeah, ultimately just trying to make sure that we're listening to, to everyone and trying to be as accessible as possible. Access gets to be quite a challenge, whether it's a hybrid class and a virtual class or totally online, for example, professors may create a lot of graphs and images or professors may write on a board or do something that is visual, not verbalizing it. And the result is that anyone who's in the class who happens to be blind or low vision won't get that information. And that's one of the access areas, I think, especially in colleges, but not just colleges, where there is a, a lot of challenge and sometimes the requirement for a lot of advocacy because the information isn't made available and it, it isn't something that technology in of itself is going to fix. It's an attitudinal choice that one has to make. Right. I agree with that a hundred percent. And I, I will say it does get easier with technology. So, so for example, I will make sure that closed captioning is on all of the videos that I record. So if anybody, um, you know, needs closed captioning services. We have those available now at no charge. Um, and then we have also transcripts that come along with our Zoom recordings. So if a student needs a transcript to be able to use with um, one of the services that Disability Resource Center offers um, to be able to read those transcripts out to the students, we have those as well. So, so there certainly have been improvements, but it's, mm -hmm. it's up to the individual faculty on whether or not to utilize them. So I agree. It's certainly an attitude thing as well, trying to make sure everybody's on board. Um, I, I mean, I can't speak to anybody else, but, but sure. I'm, I'm hoping that my classes are accessible as possible. <laughs> well, well, here's, uh, another, here's another example. So you create a video, or let's say you, you create some sort of video where there's music or there are a lot of images that are put on the video. What kind of audio description do you create in order to make sure that a person who can't see the images and the video part of it is able to access it? And that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about that yeah. we tend, we're, we're a lot less, well, able is the wrong word, but we are a lot less likely to include those things, even though they may be just as important to be able to do, or you create a document uh, or you scan a document and create a PDF of it, the problem is that's a graphic. And so it is totally unavailable to a person who uses a screen reader to verbalize or to, to be able to interpret the document unless the optical character recognition process is doable. And again, it, as a result, it becomes inaccessible. And those are the, the kinds of things that we haven't done a lot with yet. And it's not something that you can easily automate. It is a process that somebody has to put time into. One of my favorite things that I that I love to complain about, I don't love to complain about it, but that I complain about is television advertising. How many ads today just have music or just have sound, but no verbalization so that unless you can see it, you have no clue what's going on. And the reality is what you what you do by not having words is leave out not only people who are blind or who can't see it, but you're missing the opportunity to market to all those people who get up during commercials and go do something else like get a, a snack or a beer or whatever, because all they hear is music and they don't hear anything that helps the commercial continue to keep their focus on the product. Right. 
Right. No, and that makes total sense. I mean, you, I try and think, you know, based on the materials that I teach, whether it be closed captioning service for those who are, who are hearing uh, impaired or, right. you know, whatever the case may be, you, you kind of try and think of those things, but you're right. There's some things that I've never even thought about that I, I hope I would be empathetic to if a student needed those, uh, those, that assistance, but yeah, it's, it is certainly, there's a lot of barriers there. Well, here's the other part of it. Um, it isn't just the, the student who may come in and need it. Uh, you archive classes. Um, the student, yes, the students do have access to previous classes, right. uh, but you have to be enrolled in the class in order sure. to get access to the material. Yeah. But if that's the case, then without having that information accessible in the archive classes, they're just as unavailable um, as, as anything because they weren't made accessible from the outset. So it is a, it's a process. I know it's not inexpensive, but if we truly are dealing with accessibility, that is kind of one of the things that we need to explore and maybe the day will come when there are better ways to automate a lot of that. It's not here yet. I don't know whether you checked out Accessibe, um, the company that I work for and, and help, but it has begun the process of in part, at least creating an automated process to make websites accessible by analyzing the content of the websites with an artificial intelligent widget and it can do a lot to make websites more accessible, mm. but it won't be able to do everything. It, it's, it's amazing what it can do because you can oftentimes using the widget, analyze an image and get a description of it. Like on my website, if you go to michaelhinkson.com, there is a picture of me hugging my guide dog, Roselle, the dog who was with me in the World Trade Center. When the image was first encountered by Accessibe before we did anything with it, it analyzed the image and embedded a description that said, man in black suit hugging yellow Labrador retriever, which is incredible in of itself. But the reality is it doesn't do what we really wanted it to do was to say, which is to say, Michael Hinkson hugging Roselle. So we embedded code and Accessibe will leave it alone. But already we're seeing the, the machine process do a lot to analyze images. And over time, it will get better. But we can't automate videos and put in video or audio descriptions yet and things like that. And maybe the time will come to do it. But in the short term, it means that, that people have to make the effort to do that. Right. And should make the effort to do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a process and you know, we're not there and a lot of people don't think of it. You mentioned that COVID was something that helped bring a lot of this to the forefront and it did, but not always in a positive way. Like the Kaiser Health Foundation did a survey in 2020 of COVID-19 websites for registering to get when it started vaccines, but before then to get tests and get tested. And out of the 94 websites that the foundation researched, 10 had made some effort to include accessibility. And the reality is most hadn't, which is unfortunate. Mm -hmm. it, is, yeah. it is a process. And I only bring it all up. It's, it's interesting to discuss it, but hopefully it will help people think about more accessibility kinds of things in the future as we go forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was hoping, I mean, there's little things that I've learned over the years, things like, you know, when it comes to folks who, um, need uh, certain services. Uh, I don't remember exactly which um, which disability this was, but there was one particular condition where folks, it, it was hard for them to read color. It was easier if it was 100% black and white versus on a ah. gray scale. So, so, um, so yeah, I made sure, okay, this is in black instead of in a, a gray or a blue or whatever, because at University of Florida, our college, our colors are orange and blue. And so a lot of the stuff that I was making was in orange and blue. Um, however, somebody was like, you know, it's actually really hard for me to be able to see this. I'm visually impaired and having, you know, I, again, I don't remember what condition it was, but it was easier for her to, to read in black and white. And I was like, sure, absolutely. Let's do this. So Hopefully, I mean, it's the more that we learn and the more we're exposed to different things, the more accessible, hopefully, that we can make the material. And when we're talking about vision impairments, the reality is 
what you just described is a lot easier to do today than it used to be because so much is stored electronically. You can quickly go in and change the colors and reprint or whatever. Mm -hmm. And even the student might be able to do that. But the fact is that you can do it and that really helps a great deal. Yeah, I'm absolutely. I'm I'm hoping that as as time goes on, of course, I'll be exposed to to different things and be able to to make those accommodations for my students. But hoping that you know everyone uh, around the country will be able to recognize some of the things that we can do as a population to be able to make things more accessible. Yeah, we need to become a lot more inclusive than we tend to be today, and we're working on it. Um, diversity doesn't tend to include disabilities, but you can't very well leave us out of inclusion otherwise you're not inclusive right so it's it's a yeah. it's a challenge but you know we're, we're we're working on it collectively as a society and i am sure that we will eventually get there but it is an effort and it's always about awareness to get people to think about it well so you have had a lot of experiences and are doing a lot of fun things so what are you going to do in your future what are your future goals so my goal uh, is, is to keep on building Beyond 120 and hopefully to scale. Um, we have had in, like I said, Beyond, Beyond 120 was just launched in 2018. We had two years where we were just completely cut off um, in certain areas, but at least in excursions, we've had about 250 students participate in excursions, but our college serves 11,000 students. Uh, so I want to be able to scale that up. Um, we want to give more scholarships to students um, in various populations. I know one of my students, uh, I won't say her name, but she is absolutely precious. She's a single mom. Um, her child is about two or three, I believe now. Um, she started off in her freshman year in one of my classes. We were able to get her a scholarship uh, to participate in an internship. And that scholarship went to babysitting costs, you know, because a lot of times those not traditional populations have different challenges than our traditional 1822 population. So um, I would love to provide more scholarships to students um, of any population. Uh, and we would love to, to really help students get to where they need to go. Um, so, I mean, we're actually, our, our excursion is entirely donor funded. And so we're just reaching out to various UF alumni and saying, hey, come, come give back in whatever capacity you can, whether that's money, whether it's time, um, investing in a student simply through giving them a mentorship consultation. So I would love to be able to reach a larger population within our college um, and make an impact. And I, I Ultimately, I can only impact the, the folks that here at the University of Florida. However, I would love to share what we've done with other universities and in, really encourage other universities to, to support students in those non-traditional ways through experiential learning. Uh, I presented at a Duke University online pedagogy conference last Wednesday uh, and was able to share that with a few people. So any impact that, that we can make on any other schools, um, I would certainly love to be able to see that happen. That is exciting. It'd be great if you could do something with all 11,000 students at University yeah. of Florida, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, 11,000 students times $2,000 per scholarship is a lot of money. <laughs> well, so we okay. have a long way to go. <laughs> yeah, well, that's okay. It's, it's something that's still doable. I've seen colleges receive a whole lot larger donations, but it is a process. So once you get your PhD, what will you do? Are you going to continue to work at University of Florida? Will you have the opportunity to do that or what? Yes. I, I mean, my, well, I'll say this. My husband is in the Air Force. Um, he is a surgical resident right now at UF, and which is why I'm able to, to stay here. And I will be here for the next six years. Um, and then kind of depending on where he goes, uh, I'm, I will be following him and, and the University of Florida has expressed interest in keeping me here in, in more of a remote position if the, if the situation calls for it. Um, so potentially just kind of traveling to help facilitate some of these opportunities, but I would really love to scale the program up and be able to share with other universities the impact of this program. Um, and of course, to continue impacting students would be my ultimate goal um, in the future. Interesting idea to figure out a way to expand it to other universities and whether you do it through the 
University of Florida, or there's a way to start a company to do Beyond 120 worldwide, right? Beyond there 120 Inc. Beyond <laughs> 120 go. Inc. Yes, exactly. I will say though that I though I have marketing and communication skills, I do not have as much business skills. So I would need somebody to help me with that. <laughs> I'll bet you could find someone at UF to help with that. Yes. Well, I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited. We'll we'll see what happens. But um, but no, it's a great start. Um, we're excited to see now that COVID is we've gotten a, a, a bit of a handle on it. Certainly have a long way to go with that, but yeah. Um, certainly just happy to see now that things have kind of calmed down a little bit, what opportunities are going to uh, be open for us in the future. I'll say I'm, I'm presenting at the National Association of Colleges and Employers uh, next month uh, to share our model with other schools. So hopefully that'll go well and we'll be able to, to impact other universities there. That's exciting that you'll be able to do that. And of course, that's a kind of teaching, but you're going to continue to teach. Oh, absolutely. That's the bread and butter of our program. Um, we have the coolest classes. Of course, I have to brag on industry insights because that's my class that, that I created, but we have other really cool courses. We have a course called the art of adulting, um, you know, kind of teach students, what, what does it mean to be an adult, you know, and just have that interesting uh, open discussion. Um, we have a global pathways course. We have a professional pathways, just expose students to various industries and particularly the skills correlation. Just to say, you know, if you're going to be a lawyer, great. But what are the skills that go into being a lawyer? What do you need? Things like problem solving, critical thinking, communications, teamwork, all of those skills um, that go into any profession. And we laugh, we, we provide students in the internship course, what's called the SDS assessment. Uh, and it will basically ask you a, a bunch of questions and then tell you based on your skills, some of the top career choices that align with those particular skills. And it cracks the students up a lot of time. I know it cracked me up because uh, one of my top job matches was a tattoo artist. And I'm going, what on earth? <laughs> I cannot draw for anything in the world. Uh, but, but we just kind of had to dig deeper and say, you know, what are the skills that I have that perhaps a tattoo artist would have or a marketing manager would have or whatever. So, you know, really teaching the students a value of having some of those transferable skills that you can have in any, any job. You mentioned earlier about people who had an influence on your life. Mm -hmm. um, I gather you have some people that, that really have made a great impact on you. I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, Ula Isaac, uh, I don't know if, if <laughs> she'll ever hear this, but she was the internship coordinator who, you know, I walked into her office and I had a rainbow colored resume. It literally had every color in the rainbow on it. And she looked at me and said, Brittany, what on earth is this? You, you do not need a rainbow colored resume. And so we kind of worked together over the course of the semester. And she was the one that, that got me the job at uh, Orlando Health, that got me that internship that launched the rest of my career. And so I want to be the Ula Isaac for, for all of my students. So she was definitely an influence. Um, my immunologist was a huge influence. Um, he's the one that you know worked with me in the midst of having uh, an immune deficiency. And I'll say, I, I didn't mention this earlier, but I've had four very significant surgeries, um, three of which were open heart surgeries. So, you know, he's, he's been there in the midst of all of that. Um, and, and just my, my family too, you know, as, as my husband and I, um, talk about starting our own family saying, you know, what type of influence do I want to be on my kids, uh, just as I am on, on, on my students. So, um, that that's kind of my goal is to really make a positive impact on others through, through various capacities. Well, and you're certainly working toward it by any standard and that's, yeah. that's as good as it gets, you know, you're making every effort that you can. So in 10 years, you're going to be doing the same thing. <laughs> Hopefully I'll, I'll have more of a leadership role. Um, and, and we'll be able to have grown. I mean, Hey, let's say we get a million 10 million, $100 million donation for, for the program. Hopefully we'll be able to hire lots of me and not literally, but lots of people in my role <laughs> and, um, 
and, and be able to scale up and influence thousands of uh, more students. And ultimately, I would love to to travel and be able to share with other colleges some of the things that we've learned and see how we can help impact those students as well. Um, I mean, you see, I mean, even, even going along the employer side, you see a lot of employers saying, oh, we're going to pay our interns $8 an hour, or we're going to pay our interns nine or ten dollars an hour and the reality is amazon and you know starbucks and a lot of other employees they're they're saying hey we'll pay you fifteen dollars an hour and so students don't feel as much of a need to do internships anymore because they can go work at a part-time position for a lot more money and so we're encouraging employers listen you want to make sure that you are offering our students a competitive rate because we want to make sure that students are getting access to internships and for especially for our students who have significant financial barriers this is something that we strongly encourage employers listen and you need to meet that growing rate because we want students to have access to whatever it is that you're teaching them because they're so, so, so valuable. And I know um, the federal folks up in DC are just starting to pay interns. So mm -hmm. encouraging employers, encouraging students and really making those, those connections. So yes, yeah, so I'll eventually kind of be doing the same thing. I hope it's at a, a broader scale though. <laughs> well, hope you can, hopefully you can work with companies to get them to fund the internships and pay appropriate wages and so on. And, and, you know, maybe it would be to their interest because some of those people then will join those companies and, and move forward. But as far as having lots of you doing it, you know, uh, we're not cloning people and that's a good no, thing. No. So, <laughs> so, so it's you, but it is really exciting what you're doing. If people want to learn more about it or reach out to you, how can they do that? So uh, I find that the, the easiest way, and I tell this to my students as well, the easiest way is just to Google UF Beyond 120, uh, and, and that'll bring you to our website. And it's uh, actually held through the Academic Advising Center. So when students go to get their advising services, a lot of times they'll forward them to us uh, if they're saying, hey, I'm, I'm not quite sure what classes to take based on my career interest, or hey, I want to participate in an internship, I don't know where to go. So we're held within the Academic Advising Center. So if you see academic advising, you are in the right place. Uh, so we are uh, UF Beyond 120. And then um, I can certainly send my my email to you as well. Uh, it's Brittany Grubbs at ufl.edu. Uh, and so happy to, to chat with anybody who's interested in, you know, replicating the program for their own college or, or maybe donating some time uh, to helping the students. We certainly appreciate that. So do the email one more time and spell it if you would. Absolutely. It's B-R-I-T-T-A-N-Y-G-R-U-B-B-S at ufl.edu. UFL and for University of Florida, edu for education. There you go. So people who are interested, maybe you'll hear from some other schools and colleges and universities or companies that might be willing to contribute to the program. We're certainly willing to advocate. So anything we can do to help, um, hopefully this will raise awareness and that uh, some people will reach out to you. And I would love to hear what you, what you encounter as you're going forward. I would love that. I would love that. It, regardless of what anyone has to donate, whether it's money, time, or, or anything else that people are interested in, we are certainly appreciative of, of anything that people have to offer. Well, Brittany, thanks very much for being here with Unstoppable Mindset. This hour has gone by in a hurry, hasn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you <laughs> which so much is, for having me. Which is why this is always fun. As always, any of you listening, I'd love to hear what you think please reach out to us. You can reach me, Michael H-I, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-H-I at accessibe, A-C-C-E-S-S-I-B-E dot com. I'd love to hear your thoughts. You can also go to our podcast page, which is www.michaelhingson.com, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-H-I-N-G-S-O-N.com slash podcast. Wherever you go, wherever you're listening to this podcast, please give us a five-star rating. We really appreciate that a lot. I do want to hear your comments. If you know of other people, and Brittany, you as well, if you know of other people who ought to be guests on Unstoppable Mindset, please let us know. We're always open to hearing about more people. And I appreciate those of you who even over the last week have emailed us about that or reached out. Anytime people want to talk to us about guests or just thoughts about the podcast, we want to hear them and we will respond. 
So again, Brittany, thanks very much for being here. Thank you, Michael. Really appreciate it. And we look forward to all of you joining us next time on Unstoppable Mindset.